friends, my name is Emily and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be sharing with you a mid-year freakout tag. I have been seeing people do this and I feel like this is a fun way to get back into making content. I have pulled these questions from books like Lala's description box. I'm just going to answer the questions as she has them and slightly rephrase them for myself. The first question here is how is your reading going? Editing Emily. To summarize my original answer here, I feel like it's going all right, all things considered. So the second question here is, what are the best books of 2023? I found myself when even thinking about doing this tag being like, what have I read this year? Like, it's like my brain is a sieve and like I'm reading things for distraction and for work. A good thing I keep notes because so many of these things like it's just like move on to the next one, find the next distraction, f pick up the next thing for work. And so I had to go through my story graph actually and go to my five star reads and see what lived in that column. So there are 15 books here. We Belong to the Drum by Sandra Lamouche. This was for work. It is a picture book and it is about music and sharing of culture, making an indigenous child feel safe in daycare. Very cute. Women Talking by Miriam Taves was a reread and it was a five star book at the time. It was still a five-star book on the reread. I reread it for the Oscar Best Picture nominations because I wanted to watch the movie. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison, phenomenal read. The Magic Cap by Muriel Messier is a picture book. It was really cute. It's funny that I made it a five-star read because it was cute, but at this point, many months later, not super memorable. I read that in March. Then I reread First Test Protector of the Small because I needed something like safe and cozy. It was in a really bad place in a reading slump. Uh, Swim Team by Johnny Christmas is something that I just read June 29th, so it just makes it into the first half of the year. That was a graphic novel about a black girl named Brie who ends up moving down south, I want to say to Florida, where like pools are super common, but she's never learned to swim. It talks a lot about the lost history of swimming amongst black folks in America because of segregation, racism and segregation that banned folks from public and private beaches, uh, from public pools. There's this like history of black folks losing the ability to swim because you don't have access to bodies of water to teach children to swim. It was really good. It was really cute. I really liked the character arc, the development, the illustration was great. So that makes sense that's here. White is for Witching by Helen Oyemi is a reread. I also didn't change the star rating on that. It's a five out of five stars for the emotional reaction to it. Looking at it this time for the book club, I feel like it's a little bit too much. Like narratively, it's doing too much but my emotional reaction to it was still like, oh my gosh, I love this, so I didn't change the star rating. Another book for work was Borders by Thomas King. This is a graphic novel adaptation of Thomas King's short story. Uh, it's about an Indigenous person who gets trapped between the Canadian and US borders because they refuse to identify with either colonial imposition on their identity, like the traditional territory runs through both countries that colonialism has imposed this border on. Because they refuse to identify as Canadian or American, neither border will let them cross. Um, so they can't go to America, which is their intended destination, and they can't go back home to Canada because they <laughs> won't claim an identity that doesn't resonate with them. It's a really good short story. It's a really great graphic novel adaptation. Loved it. Another book for work is The Secret Pocket by Peggy Yanicki. So this is about residential schools and Indigenous resilience. Children taking the skills of sewing that were passed down and sewing secret rag pockets inside their dresses to hide food, steal food and hide food and share it with younger children to ensure survival. It's a picture book. Serious subject matter, but teaching little folks about this history of colonialism and trauma and the resilience. And I also reread Page by Tamara Pierce. Again, a favorite. I read Remote Control by Nnedi Okorafor. It's funny that I gave it five stars because I remember really liking it, but also at this moment, I finished that in February, at this moment in early July, I can't really remember much about it other than like a girl is cursed with powers and she's sort of like 
feared and becomes this figure of folklore. I might have to reread it. Then I read another book for work, and this is phenomenal. I would love to own a copy of this. Dear Dandelion by S.J. Okomo is about the aliveness of Indigenous communities in spite of colonialism, the resilience, and using the dandelion as a metaphor. This thing that continues to persist, to grow anywhere, um, even though the dandelion is a non-native plant, um, using it as a metaphor for Indigenous resilience. It is beautifully illustrated, beautiful messaging. I loved it. Another surprise that I'm going to talk about later is Tremendous Things by Susan Nielsen. The Haunting of Hill House was a fantastic read of this year. Another reread, loved it. And then a surprise when I needed it was Only When It's Us, the first book in the Bergman Brothers series by Chloe Lees. This sparked the reading of her entire Bergman Brothers series as a source of comfort during some difficult times. The third question here is the best sequels of 2023, and I have read some sequels, some of them unremarkable, like Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. Like, that's one that was sort of like, mm, I'm not gonna buy the third book in the series, I'm gonna borrow the third book in the series because I can see this going off course. If I have to pick, like, best sequels, it's clearly the rest of the Bergman brothers because I read the first one and then just like devoured the next five books in this series. I'm waiting for the seventh book to sort of wrap up the Bergman brothers series. There are seven siblings, so obviously six books out now, one book left. Like I'm waiting for that and each one is quite unique as I explore romance, which we're going to get to in another question as well. There is for myself a fine line between finding this predictable comfort and reading the same story beat for beat over and over again with just like basically the names of the characters changed. I feel like the Bergman brothers meet for me personally the comforting predictable piece of this equation without feeling boring. My favorite rereads were Women Talking, White is for Witching, and Hill House, all of which made it to the five stars, the genre that you've been loving reading the most. And again, I'm not sure about loving this genre as much as needing this genre and seeking it for comfort. Historically, this is not a genre that I have sought out, and here I am now in a place where I'm like, okay, I need that. Okay, I need something familiar. I need something predictable. I need something easy to follow. If I zone out for 10 minutes, it doesn't really matter because you can loop yourself back in really easily. Exploring the romance genre has been really valuable at this time because it gives me something like escapist. It allows me to continue with this hobby and feel like myself, like a large part of my identity is being a reader. So I don't know that I love this genre. Um, I might by the end of the year be like, yeah, I, I am a horror reader that also loves romance. So yeah, a lot of mixed feelings. So the next question is new releases you haven't read but want to. The whole book buying thing has been sort of thrown out this year. I really wanted to do a year of like truly no buying, low buying, following set rules, reading what I own, and that's really not where I'm at. Um, I also historically have identified pre-orders as a problem and tried not to do it, and this year I have pre-ordered a couple of books. I have been pretty good about reading most of my pre-orders as they come in, with the exception of these two. So these are very highly anticipated for me. I love Sherry Dimaline, Cherry Dimaline. I have to learn how to pronounce her name at some point. And so I pre-ordered Venko, which is her latest adult fiction, and I pre-ordered Funeral Songs for Dying Girls, her latest young adult fiction, and I want so badly to read both of these. I have loved everything that I've read from her so far. The problem is that I know that these are going to take a lot of mental energy. These are texts that I'm going to want to give attention and love and, and critical thinking to, and I don't have the mental capacity for this right now. And when I pre-ordered them, I did. 
<laughs> and so this is like the danger of myself with pre-orders. I am hopeful that I get to these this year, that as the year progresses, things get a little better, a little easier. The next question here is most anticipated releases for the second half of the year, and I have three. And of course, these are the three that I've pre-ordered. Uh, so Heartstopper Volume 5, this is allegedly the last Heartstopper graphic novel. I love that they are like queer young adults. I almost want to say fantasy. Like they read in the same way that a lot of these like hetero romances that I'm reading are just like, and everything works out, unicorn farts and sparkles. Heartstopper doesn't have the like queer tragedy element that I feel like a lot of queer young adult texts have in order to be considered important and worthy and like catching media attention for being like hard-hitting issue books. Heartstopper has a little bit of that, but more than anything is just queer joy, and I love that. Then I have the third book by Freya Marsk, A Power Unbound. This has potential to be the queer Harry Potter replacement that I want. We'll have to see how this series ends. This feels a little bit like super gay graphic sex grown-up Harry Potter in the Deathly Hallows searching for important objects to solve a big problem with the big bad sort of way. And then kind of an impulse that could be a disaster is A Haunting on the Hill. This comes out on October 3rd. It is like a first book licensed in the Shirley Jackson universe. It is going to be playing with Hill House. Given that I started the year with this Haunted House book club reading A Haunting of Hill House, the fact that this is coming out near the end of the year and I'm spending the whole year thinking about haunted houses, I am excited. I'm trying not to have high hopes because it is going to be, I think, difficult to live up to any sort of hype that I might have for this text, but I'm excited for it nonetheless. Biggest disappointment of this year, and it's odd because I love this book and I also hate this book. I started the year, again, this is another book I started the year with. This was a Red Room exclusive. We decided to read and talk about Fairy Tale by Stephen King. If I turn my brain off, this could be my favorite book of the year because I think it's Stephen King in a way that feels very Stephen King, in a way that he hasn't felt like peak career Stephen King in a while. Like, my favorite Stephen King is like mid-80s, early Dark Tower books, and this truly reminds me of that in a way that a lot of his more recent books haven't. It's a dark fantasy, a boy going into another world, going on a quest. It is dark. It is very much the, the character story that I love. The reason I find it really disappointing is because it is 2022, 2023. The disability rep in here falls into the magical cure, which is an ableist trope. It's just disappointing because this could be a favorite, this could be a comfort read, except I have to ignore the disability rep. And that is hard to do because it comes up over and over again. Almost every character that you meet is disabled or disfigured in some way. So the next question is, what is your biggest surprise from this year? And that is Tremendous Things by Susan Nielsen. So Susan Nielsen is a big deal in Canada. <laughs> she worked on Degrassi and she's known for gritty, real, young adult writing, both on page and on screen. I did a reading vlog. I think it's like a March Slices of Life. It might be a patron exclusive, actually. I don't know if I ever put it online because um, I ended up working with this author and like the school. The teachers picked this and then the school board read it and they were like, um, can you 
get Susan Nielsen to not talk about this book basically, just talk about writing in general and how she became an author because we don't want her having to answer questions or talk about any of the puberty things in this book. One of my coworkers was like, hey, you've read a lot of children's lit. Have you read this? And I was like, no, I haven't. And the two of us were wondering like, is this because of the, the plot summary of this, which mentions a sort of queer eye makeover of the protagonist, Wilbur, who has two moms, we were like, is the school board being homophobic or what? Like, are we asking Susan Nielsen to censor something like really central to this book if she's not talking about any of the puberty things? And so I ended up reading this and the puberty things are like Wilbur being really obsessed with his penis and how small it is and how active it is and discovering the joys of anal play. Um, and so it wasn't really about the sexuality, the, the homosexuality present in the text at all. It was about the self exploration. This is just a delightful story about like an intergenerational friendship between Wilbur and his like 80 year old neighbor and Wilbur sort of coming out of his shell and making friends his own age at the same time that he has this quite valuable friendship with an older gentleman because he has two moms so he doesn't really have an older gentleman to um, an older man to ask for advice and so in many ways this was very heartwarming. I just so surprised that I loved it. I ended up reading so many Susan Nielsen books after this which leads me to the next question which is a favorite new to me author. So Susan Nielsen I ended up reading I think two other books that were on our reading list and then ever since then every time I go to a used bookstore I have been looking for Susan Nielsen and scoring so I have uh, three titles that I've managed to find used that are Susan Nielsen titles that I would love to get to. Erin Bow is another new to me author. She's quite well known in like the children's Camlet space for Plain Kate, which I haven't read but would like to read. I believe that's young adult fantasy. And what I read this year was, again for work, Simon sort of says, it is middle grade contemporary. It's about a boy who has survived a school shooting and is living with the PTSD and anxiety post that, but it's also just morbidly funny. Simon ends up making friends with some kids who are like, the scientists feel sad that they're not getting any contact from aliens, so let's see if we can falsify a message from outer space. And like, it's just wacky small town hijinks. I loved it, like the wacky small town hijinks feels like it could take place in Stars Hollow, which I also love and I'm very nostalgic for. Like, give me small town weirdness any day, please. And then um, obviously Chloe Lease. The next question is a book that made you cry. Quite a few children's books actually were devastating. Simon Sort of Says by Aaron Bow, Tremendous Things by Susan Nielsen. Um, there were a couple of picture books on death and grieving. Oh, I, I've skipped over a couple of questions. A new favorite character? I don't have one. A book that made me happy? I mean, there were books that made me happy while I read them because they were distracting. I think a lot of the best books here have made me happy. The most beautiful book you've brought into your collection this year. I really love the Venco cover. I think just the symmetry, the colors, it looks like chalkboard painting. There's a little bit of like gold with the birds. I, I just think it's very eye-catching and intriguing. What books do you need to read, need or want to read by the end of the year? There are the patron vote books. So the voting tier of my patrons every month gets a photo of two books with a little blurb on each of them and they're around a theme and it's helping me to tackle my TBR. So there's those. There are the book club books. There are three haunted house books left and three Stephen King books left and then I think two Stephen King novellas from different seasons. And then the real goal here is to read the pre-orders. So I have obviously the, the two Sherry de Moline pre-orders, and then I have the three pre-orders that I mentioned earlier, my anticipated releases. If nothing else, I would like to read the pre-orders, ideally as they show up in my mailbox. They are quite spaced out, other than these two which have already arrived, like the two Sherry de Moline books that have already arrived. Uh, the rest of the pre-orders are spaced out so that it's like 
one a month, that also seems very doable. The next question is favorite content I've produced this year? The live streams. Here's something that I've been struggling with and I've been thinking about what I want to do, what I want to change, and I feel like my content is very stagnant. And part of that is like not having the mental capacity to do what I want to do. I now work with the books. I spend all day thinking about books and authors and putting together really awesome programming for this fall festival. Like I am the festival program coordinator. I spend all day thinking about the books that we're featuring, our backlist, market contemporaries. I spend a lot of time researching. I have subscribed to several things either through work, I have a subscription now, or on my own I've subscribed to like not-for-profits um, that do children's lit work. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of reading, it's a lot of thinking, it's a lot of research. Something that I've been trying to do is get more involved in my community, get more involved in my friend circle. The time that is left to do hobbies feels really small and precious. I am focusing on the things that really bring me joy, which is doing those like really engaged readings for the live streams, spending hours every night after work researching, reading those academic articles, putting together notes. Like the content that I'm most proud of is the content that I am finding the most rewarding. I have to figure out the content piece. So yeah, I think my favorite content this year has been the Haunted House series. And the last question here is favorite book community members. And I have to say that I haven't been watching a lot of booktube. Again, I don't have a lot of time, but something that I have really enjoyed that I only just discovered despite it being around for quite a while is the World Hoppers channel. So it is a collaborative channel where the funds go to charity. Some of the episodes like bring together a bunch of different folks and they'll talk about like a topic or I think they all did this mid-year freakout tag, but like fantasy readers do it and then romance readers do it. And like those have been really fun. It is fun to watch people chat and collaborate in that way. And again, I don't have a lot of time. I have been drawn to like longer content because we are car free at this point. Our car died, we didn't replace it. I spend a lot of time on the bus going anywhere, either for work or choir or these needles, visiting my parents. Like I'm on the bus a lot. I like to download longer videos, podcasts, anything in that style for these commutes. And so the World Hopper channel has been great because they are longer. I've been really, really liking that. And if you haven't checked it out, I would recommend it. That is the mid-year freakout tag. It has been a weird year. I feel like I've been saying that every year since the pandemic. Like I haven't had a year where I'm like, oh my gosh, year to remember for fantastic reasons. It's like all of these years are years to remember for terrible reasons. Thank you for following along on this journey. Thank you to my patrons who make videos like this possible and for their continued support throughout this weird year. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Speaking of the haunted house and things that I enjoy, the next public live stream will be on August 29th and we are reading Mapping the Interior by Stephen Graham Jones. This is a tiny novella. It is an indigenous writer and we are looking at a haunted house where the inside is bigger than it appears on the outside. I think that's it. Those are all of the things. Those are all of the things. I hope that you all are doing well, that you are staying safe, and I will see you soon. Bye.